What happened yesterday is that Michael Tracy, the journalist, started a room in when the title was approximately um, is Clubhouse too obsessed with wokeism or something like that. Um, in any case, uh, I went into this room quite late, I think. The discussion was well underway. Michael Tracy was, I believe, um, having difficulty moderating the room. Uh, a person uh, came onto the stage to speak and challenged the fact that there were, by her accounting, no people of color uh, with moderator privileges. Michael Tracy made her a moderator. Uh, I did not see that interaction, but that's what I've been told. And then a coup took place, and everybody in the room acknowledged by the end of this discussion that it was a coup. So the person who had been given moderator privileges first kicked uh, Michael Tracy out of the off the stage, then kicked all white people off the stage, and the conversation radically shifted. Um, and it, you know, so it was a takeover. Now, at one level, who cares about some takeover in some ephemeral room on Clubhouse? On the other hand, the nature of Clubhouse is a discussion, and what took place in that room was stunning, not just to me, but to many people, including Peter Bogosian, who was in the audience, and Benjamin Boyce. Now, I would just point out that uh, Peter Bogosian, Benjamin Boyce, and myself are uh, three very well-versed people when it comes to discussions of wokeness, racial interactions, right? It would be hard to impress us, and yet all three of us were impressed with what took place in this room. It was shocking. And I impressed in a negative way. Tremendously negative. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion is that most people have not heard a conversation like this one. And so in any case, the um, the nature of the... I, I think probably Peter and Benjamin and I are going to have to discuss what took place there in order that people can get any real deep sense of what it was. But what was uh, just fascinating was the fact that although in general there is a wide diversity of opinions in any clubhouse conversation above a few people, um, the diversity of opinion dropped to zero. Mm -hmm. And what happened was um, increasingly outlandish things were asserted on the stage with no objection from anybody, which spoke to what I'm going to claim is a kind of power. And one of the obvious results of this will be that anyone who is on Clubhouse and paying attention to it uh, and who knows what you just described, a moderator who is chastised, uh, who is asked to add someone else based on a demographic, may well not do so in the future. And so legitimate inquiries about increasing diversity that might be legitimate, although we can put aside for the moment whether or not um, seeking diversity across demographic features is going to maximize conversation quality, but um, that this is likely to cause exactly the opposite thing. This is going to, I mean, quite literally silo people um, more because uh, future conversations um, by moderators uh, who have created a group around them of people who you know, because it's who they know looks somewhat like them in some regard. Um, if a woman says you need more women, on, you need a woman on the stage, or a black person says you need a black person on the stage, uh, those moderators now have legitimate reason to be concerned that what is happening is not good faith, but is actually a coup attempt. So perfect. You've just described the birth of a Kafka trap. Right. You're now damned if you do and damned if you don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, of course, is a very dangerous dynamic, right? Right. Um, one certainly wants, and in fact, in general, people have been uh, pretty generous with uh, moderator privileges. And in general, the rooms are pretty well served by having a fair number of people from different perspectives have those privileges. But obviously, if anybody can kick anyone off the stage and, you know, I mean... So the idea is that any moderator has as complete a set of privileges as any other moderator, regardless of whether or not you set up the room or just, you know, just added. Exactly. Um, and so this then goes to... Eminently gameable. So gameable. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to think, I wanted to think out loud a little bit on the question of 
what is power? Because what I saw yesterday take place over, I mean, I was in the room for, I don't know, three plus hours. Um, what I saw took place was a clear demonstration of power. And in fact, the very first thing that took place in the immediate aftermath of this coup, I, I think I shortchanged the story just a little bit, was that a bunch of people on the stage, and it's very hard to tell when many people are trying to speak at once who is speaking. Mm -hmm. um, it is relatively easy to tell when one person is speaking at a time, and rooms differ as to whether or not people talk over each other or wait their turn. But in this case, many people appeared to raise their voice um, and uh, try to prevent this um, ushering of people off the stage. They wanted a, a, a room in which there was room to disagree. All of those people were eliminated. So what you had mm -hmm. was inside of, I don't know, maybe it was 30 seconds, you had a stage that was diverse become at least uh, at a racial level, become segregated. So segregation happened in this room almost instantly. And well, but and you know, frankly, more importantly, at an ideological level. Exactly. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Is not only was it racially segregated, but it was limited to those people who were apparently, and this became apparent over you know the course of hours, were apparently willing to sign on to anything offered by anyone in the room, including completely preposterous yeah. ideas. I mean, if John McWhorter or Coleman Hughes or Thomas Chatterton Williams or Chloe Valdery or, you know, any number of other, uh, you know, smart black people had shown up and said, I'd like to come up on the stage, I don't think they would have been welcome. By by by, by your account of what it sounds like was happening. There. Right. In yeah. fact, uh, John McWhorter was misportrayed on the stage. He was portrayed as a conservative, not surprising, yeah. but uh, he was portrayed that way. I was brought up, somebody noticed me in the audience, I was brought up um, um, basically to be cross-examined. I was. You mean brought up to the stage or yes. mentioned? Okay. I was brought up to the stage and I was asked if I was a white supremacist. I was oh, asked. this again. <laughs> oh, well, it's, this... It's, uh, it's almost the four-year anniversary. Why not play this game again? Well, but this is, this is exactly it. And so mm -hmm. uh, whatever else we can say about this environment, at one level, this was a lot like the ability of somebody Imagine a virtual, I, I'm not a fan of virtual reality, I'm very frightened about what it's going to do to people's cognition over time, but imagine virtual reality that would allow you to teleport into the evergreen riots with no physical sa uh, safety issue, but the ability to be first person in that situation. How much would that do for people's understanding of whether this was or wasn't an important event, whether it was or wasn't being misrepresented, right? That ability to just be present mm -hmm. is very persuasive. And so I, I have the sense, frankly, that people generally, people on both the woke and the anti-woke side would have their viewpoint altered by, you know, the ability to participate in this conversation, even just to sit in the audience and hear it taking place in front of them, would I think convince a great many people that something important was going on. And many people I expect, even on the woke side, would have the sense of actually, I don't want any part of that right? Because all of those claims are, I don't want to say all, although frankly, virtually every claim that was made was uh, extraordinary. Okay, so what's to be done then? Um, yeah, so it, this thing was ephemeral, uh, and um, you saw it firsthand. It's hardly the first time you've seen this firsthand, and so did Benjamin Boyce. It's not his first time at the nope. rodeo either. Nope. Um, Peter Bogosian, same thing. Same you know. thing. Um, and I presume I know less about Michael Tracy, but I, I, I believe that he knows uh, enough about this to have you know, recognized, at least in retrospect, what was happening. Um, so, you know, you were not further informed. Um, there, you you think there would be value in people, um, in other people who did not choose to be there in hearing or reading um, this this thing that was ephemeral. What what then? You know, what does it mean, or what value can be derived from it? All right. So, uh, for one thing, um, let's just say Peter was actually tweeting about this this morning about this conversation and his point was the re constant refrain in this discussion or at least the recurrent refrain was that it all must be burned down that this is effectively that all, civilization all oh civilization must be burned down. civilization is effectively white and that whiteness taints it beyond repair and it must be burned down now my point is for the vast majority of people who have had it, right, 
who have had it and maybe marching with BLM, the discovery mm -hmm. that there is at least a a contingent wielding substantial power whose mm -hmm. viewpoint is actually our purpose is to burn this down and yeah. then things will be better because they can't be worse, right? That discovery, the discovery that a great many people who call themselves abolitionists, whether they are talking mm. about prisons or the police or generally both, mm -hmm. right? That abolitionists have taken that honorable term and basically turned it on its head and are think it's clever to uninvent civilization and that imagine that somehow that will improve things, that that would be a wake-up call that would actually allow us, it would be the gateway to the actual conversation that we need to be having. And so this brings me back to the question of power. So loosely speaking, I would say power is the ability to reallocate or redirect limited resources, right? Whether that is people's time, whether it is their attention, whether it is money, right? Whether it is uh, access to uh, a coveted spot in a school, in a uh, an organization, whatever it is. The ability to reallocate a limited resource is power. Now, my point is power, tremendous power, is being wielded by a movement that is composed of people who actually have positions that cannot be reconciled with each other. The burn it all down people mm -hmm. are a substantial contingent. But there are lots of people who would not burn it down and know better than to burn it down, who are wielding power together with them. And my mm -hmm. point is, those two need to see each other, right? And those of us on the outside need to understand actually that the movement is these two unreconcilable things. And that means that we potentially have partners inside that movement who we can reach if they will stop signing on to this reflexive reaction. In this conversation, uh, the uh, the coup on Clubhouse, um, I, I, I was asked to say something about who I was before I was interrogated about whether I was a white supremacist and a transphobe. And there was one other thing, but I've forgotten what it was. Fascist? Uh, no. Sexist? No. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> I can those keep things. Going. Well, right. But um, I said I was an evolutionary biologist. Oh, that's just as bad. Which immediately triggered one of the people uh, interrogating me to say, oh, you mean a eugenicist? Oh, my God. I know. Wow. Wow. Um, now, I once taught with an anthropologist who seemed to conflate those two things just the same way, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing, yes. amazing thing. Wow. Yep. You know who was an evolutionary biologist? Huey P. Newton. Yes, he was. I find it unlikely that he was a eugenicist, at least not a white supremacist eugenicist, right? I mean, that just Very seems... Very little that he did in his life would seem to support that supposition. Right. It, it's, a, it's an extraordinary claim. Mm -hmm.